Hello everyone and a very good morning or afternoon depending on where you're joining us from. Thanks very much for coming along to this webinar to talk about how to ensure institutions excel with integrity. We should be taking about 45 minutes of your time today, including an opportunity for a designated question and answer session at the end. If you are familiar with the GoToWebinar software, you might know that there is a questions option as part of the panel on the right hand side of your screen. If you would like to ask questions as and when they occur to you, please feel free to type them into the panel and um, we'll be happy to gather those and answer them towards the end of the presentation. We'll also be making a recording of this webinar available as well, so if you wish to view it again or share it with your colleagues, that will be an option to you. This will be made available on Epigeum's YouTube channel at the end of this week. At the moment, you are all on mute because the feedback can sometimes affect the quality of the sound. So if you do have any questions or issues you would like to raise, please do so in the question panel on the right hand side as I mentioned before. So firstly, some introductions. That's me, Charlene Court, on the left hand side. I'm the product manager in the marketing team for Epigeum Studying Courses. We also have Dr. Dr. Tracy Bretag and Rachel Crooks joining us today who are working on the development of the new online course, Academic Integrity. Um, I'll let Tracy introduce herself now and afterwards Rachel. So go ahead, Tracy. Hi, everybody. Great to be here at 8.30 in Adelaide time in Australia. So it feels like a long way away from you guys right now. Um, I am an Associate Professor in Higher Education and the Director of the Office for Academic Integrity at the University of South Australia. And I've been researching, writing, thinking about, talking about this topic for about 15 years. So I'm really excited to be the lead advisor on this new innovative program and I hope that we make a real contribution with it. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Crooks and I work in the publishing team at Epigeum. I've been talking to Tracy about this project since last summer and I've had the real, real honour of working with Tracy and having lots of exciting conversations about how this course is going to look and what, what it's going to hopefully do for you. Um, so nice to meet you and I'll be talking later a little bit more detail about what the course will cover. Thank you guys. So just a quick look at the agenda before we get started. First I'll provide a background on Epigeum itself. We're the organisation that puts together online courses through a collaborative model. Then we'll move on to Tracy's presentation who will discuss the context of academic integrity in higher education and her vision for the academic integrity course. Following this, Rachel will give a course overview as well as talk through how our development group collaboration process works. And then finally, I'll give a brief course demonstration of one of our published courses to give you a taste of what an online course looks like. And then we'll wrap up with a Q&A session and contact details. Epigeum was founded in 2005 as a spin-out originally from Imperial College London. Our two founders created the company in response to what they felt was a lack of timely support for researchers. One of our founders was doing the PhD at the time uh, while working full-time when he came across issues that he wanted and needed to be advised on. The course that he was taking would either be a face-to-face -face course that took place three months later or an inadequate, dated and um, boring material that didn't quite fit his needs. He saw this as an opportunity to work with universities to create supported materials for researchers that gave just-in-time support for all those issues. And that's where Epigeum started. In over 10 years, we've expanded to create research, teaching and leadership programs intended for staff, professionals and researchers, as well as studying programs, courses for students, of which this will be one of. Epigeum was acquired by Oxford University Press in May 2015. OEP is a division of University of Oxford and a non-for-profit organisation. It has enabled us to further both our missions and to continue to build very high quality online courseware. To date, we have created over 92 online courses across 20 different programmes. As you can see on this slide, Epigeum is a globally focused organisation and has worked with over 280 universities across 30 different countries worldwide to date. 
Now that you have a bit of background about Epigeum, I'm going to pass on to Tracy, who will take you through the context of academic integrity and her vision for this new online course. Thank you so much. I'm not going to talk for too long, although I do get a bit excited when I'm talking about this. So I'm going to talk to you about what we're doing in the program. It's actually a suite of online courses, not just one course. That's for both students and staff, and not just teaching staff either, both types of, of uh, staff in universities and higher education providers, so administrative staff and teaching staff, with the ambitious goal of ensuring a consistent approach to academic integrity. Not just at one university, I'd like to ensure it across the sector, but that might be a bit too ambitious. The presentation, I'm going to talk about why we need to have a program like this on academic integrity, putting it in the context of a global context. Um, I did a presentation earlier on the Australasian context. I'm actually going to talk to you about the UK context and the local context and ask you questions about really who is the problem? What is the problem? Why are we seeing such a, a rise, particularly in certain types of cheating? Is it students? Is it teachers? Is it higher education providers? Um, and I'll talk about the rise of contract cheating in recent years um, and perhaps convince you that it's not business as usual talk about internationally best practice, which is recognised to be multi-pronged and holistic, and then a little bit of a word about the program before Rachel talks about it and some concluding, concluding comments. Now, I have given this presentation in its different forms and longer and shorter versions for some time. Okay, um, so I've, I've been giving this presentation in different formats and, and you know, short versions, long versions for a while now. Um, this image of a perfect storm keeps coming to my mind and my colleague Rowena Harper and I, we're working on a project together which I'll share a little bit about. This is sort of our shorthand for talking about this context, this global context. We feel like a perfect storm has been created or we're part of, um, certainly not consciously, which I think has contributed to, certainly to the, um, the rise in contract cheating particularly. Um, none of this will be unfamiliar to anyone working in higher education. We think things have changed a lot. The commercialization and marketization of higher education, we hear and we see all around us people referring to our students as customers and our courses as products. Um, our students themselves think, perhaps rightly, that they're paying quite a lot of money and they're therefore entitled to, certainly they're entitled to good education, but they're not necessarily entitled to pass every course because they've paid for it or to get that parchment. But definitely that, that sort of market speak has crept in. Internationalization, which is an amazing and wonderful and you know potentially life-changing thing in terms of understanding other cultures and countries and ideas. But internationalization has always also meant that we have large numbers of international students in our classrooms, many of whom speak English as an additional language and who come from different cultural backgrounds. And this can be enriching. But it also means we need real resources to support those students, to make sure they reach their academic potential. Part of that too is widening participation and diversification. We have more and more students studying in higher education, and that means we have an incredibly diverse student body. We have mature age students. We have students coming in who didn't even complete high school, who came in through various other pathways. We've got students coming in from um, colleges rather than directly from high school. We've got people working full-time, part-time. We've got people who've got mental and physical challenges. We've got people who are full-time carers. So we have a very diverse student body. And again, that means we need to recognize those students' needs and resource them adequately. At the same time, we've got more and more pressure on universities. Managerialism, metrics, this idea that everything can be measured and that everything has a rank. I'm sure you know everyone in the UK, just like us in Australia, has to manage the constant telling and retelling of where your university or your college sits on international rankings and national rankings. There's increasing competition at all levels for funding, of course, as there always has been. But there's increasing competition for students in terms of admission, and there's increasing competition about our performance in teaching and research. None of this is new, but I think things are being ramped up. There are socio-political and digital disruptions, which in combination and in combination with these other aspects of the global context too, make students feel, and with good reason, that job markets are more precarious. At the same time, we're telling our students, if you don't get a degree, you won't get a job. We don't even know what those jobs might be in three or four years. And then 
Lastly but not leastly, we have the sense of corruption in wider society, which has always been there, but I think we see it so much more now through social media and the sort of media scandals that are in, in place all the time. And alongside that, we have changing social values and norms, not just because we have a diverse and culturally and linguistically diverse student body, but there are generational issues around social values and norms too. And quite honestly, teachers have different ideas about what's expected as part of an academic community than many students do. And as I've mentioned here again, I'm thanking my colleague Rowena Harper because everything I'm saying is everything we talk about and think about every day. So the UK, European context, um, I was delighted um, at the end of last year that the Quality Assurance Agency report came out and made a recommendation which led to legislate against commercial cheat sites. And this is certainly what we've all been fighting for globally. There was an international day of action against contract cheating on October the 19th. And then the QAA report came out, which was fantastic. That issue was then debated in January in Parliament this year in the UK. And I think it was just the day before it was actually debated in Parliament. The article by Draper, um, Ibizim and Newton, Phil Newton, who's part of my current research project, came out. And there's a, if you can see here, there's a little, little screenshot of the article and all the various media that was attracted to that. There was a whole lot of media interest around legislating against contract cheat sites and you can have a look at that on the journal I edit, the International Journal for Educational Integrity. There's also a uh, Higher Education Academy special interest group on the topic. Uh, there's the ETNED platform, Ethics, Transparency and Integrity in Education, which is discussing the topic as well and will be again in May. I believe. There's the European Network of Academic Integrity, which has just been established. I'm on their advisory group. And a conference coming up in Bruno in Czechia. Um, and there'll be a contract cheating panel there, also uh, led by Phil Newton and myself. So the topic is huge. The topic of academic integrity is huge everywhere, but contract cheating specifically. In local contexts, um, and I think what some unique things well, some things unique to the UK is you have near universal use of text matching software. Turn it in. We don't have that in Australia, though we do use it a great deal. There is a recognition that, that software is not yet able to identify bespoke essays. I know that Turnitin's working on that. And that's an exciting development. But there's this sense that we have this tool. I wish people actually used it to its full capacity. They don't. But we have a tool. And now there's this sense, I think, in the um, higher education community that, gosh, what are we going to do? We've been sort of relying on text matching software to identify plagiarism. Now we have bespoke essays, essays written specifically and so-called originally for students that won't necessarily be picked up by text matching software. At the same time, there's a sense that there's been an exponential rise in certain types of cheating. Historically, I've always talked about academic integrity breaches rather than cheating because most of, I think, what we see by students are breaches. Plagiarism, not knowing how to paraphrase and summarise correctly, cutting and pasting too much from online sources. And by and large, those sort of breaches can be addressed with good solid education on academic literacies. But we've seen a rise in actual cheating where students deliberately, knowingly, and with intent, decide to outsource their work. So there's been a rise in that. And of course, this results in a massive caseload for people trying to investigate those, in, in, those cases. Uh, your academic conduct officers, for example, at Oxford Brookes University and elsewhere. And that takes a whole bunch of resources, especially if you end up with a university level decision making process. We were trying to do some maths on this the other day about what it would cost the university for one hour for eight senior managers to be in a room discussing a case. And it's quite a lot, not, not to mention the setup for that. You can, you can work it out. And if we have a, number, a huge number of those cases, it's costing the university a lot of money to deal with it. And of course, it's costing students a lot in terms of the sorts of penalties that they're receiving. At a minimum, they're getting failure for their course, usually suspension, expulsion, and we're seeing more and more students having their grades and even their whole degrees rescinded. But still there's a sense that academic integrity processes at most UK universities are really just scratching the surface. We've got good processes, we've got good policy at most UK universities, but still hardly, hardly touching some of these rising problems. Here's an example of some, certainly I can only give you photos from my uh, context. These are uh, images of uh, posters that are advertising cheat sites um, in Adelaide. And there's, I think, this one here, actually, this colleague sent me from Sydney. There's online 
um, cheat sites, there's social media sites. You can see here my own university. <laughs> this cheat site grabbed our own branding and pretended to be part of us, which was great. Um, and I think that's pretty common around the place. They're offering that it's plagiarism free because somehow they're putting their work through Turnitin. The irony is not lost on any of us here. But there are a great number of these posters both online and physically around the campus which promote commercial cheat sites to students. My colleague uh, Rebecca Audrey, who's actually working with Phil Newton at, at Swansea, um, to do her PhD on this topic and I asked her to put together a list and this list is the Australian domain names of cheat sites. She said to me at the time, look I can put it together for you today, by tomorrow there'll be more and there'll be different domain names if we try to stop them. And I know that number is actually much, much higher in the UK because Rebecca's been working with Phil as well. So they proliferate, proliferate daily, they're impossible to keep track of and they change domain names. So what is it? Why is this happening? I think historically it was all too easy to blame students. Oh, students, they don't understand what, it's, what it really means to be part of this academic community. They're not prepared adequately. They've got poor academic literacies. They're not engaged in their learning. They've got terrible decision making under pressure. It's all of those things, absolutely. It's not like any of those things are not important and those things will all be addressed as part of the academic integrity program. But I think there's more. I think there are more reasons for students and I think there are more stakeholders here. Is it our fault as academics, as teaching academics? Is it because we're not committed to embedding the values and practices that we espouse so openly all the time about academic integrity in our everyday work, in our curriculum design, teaching and assessment, marking and moderation? Do we talk the talk but we don't walk the walk? Is there a lack of understanding of best practices to prevent and respond to breaches, including the consistent use of Turnitin? So I said before that many people think, oh, Turnitin, you know, won't be able to help us with this. But what I've found in the audits I've done of, of um, courses is that most staff are still not using Turnitin to its full capability even now. And I've also seen that Turnitin is actually still providing a very useful tool in that I see assignments, for example, where there's a, they've cut and paste from sources, but they're cut and paste from 123helpme.com or essays.com or ukessays.com. Um, so if we even just looked at the sources provided by Turnitin, that would also give us a good clue. So we have some tools, but we're not even using those to their full capacity. Is it that we have a lack of commitment to following our good policies? I know that UK universities have good policies and processes on academic integrity that do refer, you know, provide guidance to staff on referring cases to decision makers. But like my colleagues in Australasia, many staff are reluctant to refer cases on. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. And we'll be looking at that in the Academic Integrity Program. Or is it something bigger? Or maybe it's and something bigger. Is it the institution's lack of leaders to champion this issue at every level? We need people at senior management, administrative staff, teaching and students. We want people everywhere and at every point championing academic integrity. Is it that universities are not providing a clear and consistent counter campaign against that avalanche of marketing material that I showed you a snippet of? Because those, when students are walking around campus and online and seeing those advertisements for those unscrupulous cheat sites, it starts to make people think that this is the norm. If there's no counter campaign, provided by the university. And in terms of institutions' responsibility, is it their lack of commitment to address the issue openly, collegially and with dedicated resources? Now there's many things in that sentence. The dedicated resources is one of them. It's one thing to say, yes, we care about this, but real resources have got to be put into the sort of training that we're talking about through the new EPGM program. But also we need to stop when there's a scandal, sort of saying, saying, oh, I'm not involved there. We all know that this is a sector-wide issue. It's not one university or one college that has this as an issue. We know we all have it. If we somehow escape a scandal, we've been lucky, maybe our time will come. So I think it's time for us all as a sector, globally and within the UK and Europe, to work together to address it. So it's students, it's staff, and it's the institution. So I've said there's a new era of contract cheating, and I think there really is. Um, I've been looking at this topic for about 15 years and I can say certainly there's been a concerted effort by Australian universities and I know by UK universities over the last 15 years to really improve policy and practice. 
the ATA has been so hugely instrumental in that and Jude Carroll was absolutely a global leader in promoting the whole idea of academic conduct officers and the way she looked at decision making in relation to breaches. So I know there's been a lot happening in the UK and that's really influenced us here in Australia. My own research has shown that there's been a shift from punitive to educational approaches, which can only be a good thing. We want to educate our students. Nobody became an educator so that we could stick students in jail or expel them unnecessarily. And in the last 15 years, there's been a real strong emphasis, as there should have been, on learning support and recognition of those very situations I was talking about before, our diverse students with really diverse educational, cultural and linguistic backgrounds. All of that said, I think a lot of work's been put into that, but there's been a recent shift in students outsourcing their work to third parties, which really goes beyond the idea of it being an academic literacies only issue. It is an academic literacy issue, it is a language issue, but it's more than that. We know that in the UK the standard response to contract cheating when it's detected is for the student to be suspended or expelled. But work by Phil Newton found that nearly 90% of students thought that was too harsh. In fact, 41.8, nearly 42% of students thought the penalty should just be to fail the assignment in question. Now that's no outcome at all, forget about the word penalty. The student hasn't done the work, whether they've outsourced it to a commercial provider or their mum or dad or brother or friend or other student, they haven't met the learning outcomes. To fail the assignment, it's no disincentive to act in this way at all. They were going to fail anyway. So certainly in the Australian context, certainly in my own university, we think at a minimum where there's substantial evidence to indicate a student has outsourced their work, that they should be suspended. But students feel differently about that. And we're certainly finding that in our own research. The work I'm doing with Rowena Harper, and we're right in the middle of analysing it, is really showing the importance of the teaching and learning environment, particularly the relationship between staff and students. In addition to academic literacies, language, assessment design, all of those sorts of things as well, which will be covered in our program, but the relationship between staff and students is critical. Another bit of UK research from Rigby et al. in 2015 based on a, a qualitative survey and study of 90 students found that half of those students would be willing, they said they would be willing to buy an assignment from a cheat site. I, when I first read that, I found that astonishing. Half of them said they'd be willing, depending on the circumstances. This quote here comes from a student, a master's student actually, um, in an academic integrity discussion where they said, when we have a group task, the first thing we do is sit down and ask the question, should we buy the assignment or do it ourselves? Which one would be quicker and get the best result? And today, in fact, I was in a formal inquiry and a student said something along the same lines. We found we had the evidence he had been buying his assignments, many, many, many of them online, and he just said it was cheap and it was convenient. He felt it was a reasonable approach to his study. A new project, which I've mentioned a couple of times, please feel free to go to that site and register, and then you can get updates on our data. We've got our first symposium sharing the preliminary results on over 15,000 students, the largest study of its kind in the world, um, on the 13th of April, and so you'll start to see some preliminary work getting out to the sector very shortly. Phil Newton, again, I feel like I'm promoting Phil everywhere today. He is one of yours in the UK. Um, and our colleague Chris Lang uh, talked about a multi-pronged approach to contract cheating in the Handbook of Academic Integrity. They talked about the importance of taking a technological approach, using things like Turnitin, text matching software, and any other types of services that might be available, such as computer programs which identify changes in students' voice and style, other technological means like online proctoring and um, secure systems for online uh, learning and teaching. Assessment design is obviously critical. We'll be talking about that in the program, the Academic Integrity Program, how you design assessment to minimise or reduce contract cheating. What we have discovered in our research is you cannot prevent it. Our students have said in our survey, it doesn't matter what type of assessment, right down to an oral viva, they can outsource it. Stunning. But assessment design is still important and we'll talk about that. Phil and Chris were on the money when they said relationship building between staff and students is important and we've certainly found that. Um, they've talked about legislation and in fact that their view about legislation was quoted by the QAA and has been widely cited elsewhere 
and that does require cross-institutional and sector-wide collaboration. And we think, and they, these guys think, Newton and Lang, that at the moment the only consequences are academic. For students, they might be suspended or fail a course or whatever the outcome is in your university, but there are no consequences for the cheat side. To make them illegal means there will be some consequences for their unethical behaviour. And this is a slide that anyone who's ever heard me talk about academic integrity will say, oh, there's the holistic slide. Well, just about everything I've written about, and I keep adding to this slide over the years, talks about the fact that integrity is not something that just happens in one place. It needs to be promoted in every single aspect of the academic enterprise. The way we promote our universities, the way we market what we do, our admissions processes, our policy and procedures, our assessment practices, the information we give students, but it's not enough just to do it at orientation. It needs to be everywhere and in everything. We need to think about our vulnerable students. For example, we know that international students are particularly vulnerable because of language and cultural background and different educational preparation. We know we need to provide support for those students. We've been talking about it for 20 years. Let's do it. And our program will attempt to do that as well. And not just international students. There are other vulnerable groups as well. And at every level. It's not not enough to say we've ticked that box. We've told students when they first came to the university that now they should know. Our program, our new EPIGM program, is going to target students in first year, second year, and in their senior years as well as staff. And that goes to the professional development for staff. That's going to be covered as well. I believe, and I think a number of other people would agree, that research and academic integrity are part and parcel of the same thing. If we don't train our staff and our students about academic integrity, we can hardly be surprised when there are serious breaches in the re research domain. Like Phil and Chris in their chapter, I've been saying for a long time, we need to use every new technology available both for education and detection. And as the HEA recommended back in 2011, we need a standing committee or an office or someone at the university who has a remit for this. Someone who'll say, this is my job to make sure academic integrity is embedded fostered and built across the university. So I've hinted at this already quite a bit, our program that we're developing. It's early days, but it's an exciting time because we have a vision more than the detail. But we're going to do so much more than just teaching academic skills, but we're going to do that. And we're going to do so much more than teaching ethics and values, and we're going to do that though. And we're going to do so much more than focusing on plagiarism and textual practices, but I promise you we will do that as well. But what I really want to do, I have a really ambitious agenda, is to provide a consistent training program for teaching staff, administrative staff, that's a group of people who've been left behind so often, and students at every stage and in every discipline of their study, to provide the foundation for a reinvigorated academic culture with integrity at the centre. I feel when I start talking about this I get excited because I think we have an opportunity to do something quite different here. I do think we're confronting new and serious challenges that do require new responses. We need to take on board all the international best practice and the research and talk about a systemic and holistic approach that takes into account everybody, but it does require a commitment of resources and it does require a consistent message, a consistent training program that reaches all of those various stakeholders. I'm really hoping, I'm believing, I'm putting my time and my energies into the new Academic Integrity Program because I think that would be an excellent first step. If you're interested in looking at some of the sources I've talked about, the references are all here. Great. Thank you very much, Tracy. That was a really insightful presentation. So now we're going to move on to Rachel's part of the presentation. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, what a hard act to follow. You've been so thorough and it's so fascinating to hear about what's happening and all the different challenges. So I'm going to tell you now a little bit more about the Academic Integrity Collaboration, what it will cover, why it's unique, and why we also believe that it will be groundbreaking. So Tracy talked about um, having a sense that the processes for integrity at most universities are only scratching the surface. We believe that this online course is one tool that you can use to go beyond that surface and dig a lot deeper. And these are some of the reasons why. The holistic approach to integrity that we're going to take, which will target students and staff. I won't go into that again because Tracy did it so beautifully, but if we don't, if we just continue to just talk to students, then we're going to see um, continued consequences of that. We need to take that holistic approach starting now. 
you might be used to seeing a kind of traditional pit stop plagiarism approach for students with online training. Our program is different because it takes this graduated approach that Tracy outlined. There will be three courses, one that supports the students when they first begin study, one that comes midway through their study, and one that they use as they prepare to graduate. This little and often approach has been proven in the research to be much more effective and more engaging for students. The courses will work for those from a broad range of disciplines. So what issues will affect students who are doing computer sciences, where they might submit code rather than write an essay? What does it mean to use credible sources if you're studying visual arts? You may be used to online learning that just talks to students writing essays and doing very text-based subjects. Our course will be different. The programs can be used as a standalone tool, but they're far better if they're used as part of a blended approach. We'll be developing some innovative tools that you can use to implement the programs in this way, such as workshop materials and even some assessments that you can bolt onto the course so that your students can evaluate their own skills or even submit sample work for your um, staff to evaluate too. We're really going to tackle contract cheating from both the staff and the student perspective. What is it? How does it work? Why you shouldn't do it? And what are the consequences? And also helping staff to really kind of lift the veil on contract cheating and, and see what it is they can be doing to tackle the issue. Because we, as we know, it's complex and difficult. We'll be developing an impact measurement tool so that you can evaluate the effectiveness of the course. How is it helping your students? And what has it done specifically for the staff at your institution who are taking it? Here is a little overview of the student programme. There's not an incredible amount of detail here, but we do have a very detailed outline of what will be covered. So if you're interested in more information, please do drop us a line. The student programme is um, broken into three courses. Like I said, one for the early studies, one for mid-studies, and one for pre-graduation. Each course will take approximately an hour, so the student is getting about three to four hours in total. The course screens will be short, and on each screen will be an interactive activity. Interactivity is absolutely the heart of what we do. So as the student progresses through the courses, they do interactive quizzes, tests, and they learn through doing. There'll be evaluation tools on each course, and there'll be the option to build more sophisticated assessment tools in, but there will be quizzes and standard evaluation tools for each course. Let's have a look at the staff program. So the staff programme is written with three different audiences in mind, those who teach, those who support teaching staff, and those who support students, because we know that everybody has a role to play in this academic integrity culture that we're trying to build, and everyone's role is slightly different. So the, the staff go onto the programme and they can select from the modules on the left. We've indicated in the table which modules are most appropriate for which groups, but it's really up to the staff to, to you know, tailor their own programme there. The modules will look at a lot of different things. One of the modules will look at technology. This is just one tool that can be used for academic integrity. We're not saying it's the only tool, um, but it is an important part of the, the package. There'll be a module looking at breaches, what actually happens and what, what, what is best practice for dealing with academic integrity breaches. We're going to use some really great case studies that we'll gather from different institutions to show how, how best to approach this area. Module 3 is really important. This is the teaching and learning component where we will look at good assessment design. This module will be based on the absolutely most up-to-date evidence um, for making a case for good assessment design as a key tool for academic integrity. What does it mean to do this on a practical level? We'll look at it across a range of subjects and again we'll use really great case studies to equip your staff with the skills. And then we'll have two other modules, one on supporting students in an academic integrity culture, what can and should we be doing to help them, and what should we be doing to support staff in this culture too. These modules will also be very, very practical with real best practice case studies, tips, and um, real tools that you can use. So what does a development group do? I can talk briefly now about the development group process. Um, if you join the collaboration with Epigeum, uh, you would become part of a development group, and you'd have several opportunities to, to get involved with shaping the programme. You would be part of a group of um, universities who would agree the detailed course curriculum, and you would participate in a launch workshop, which means coming together for a couple of days with all the other universities, with the authors, with the lead advisors, with the reviewers and the PGM, to really go through the details of what will be covered, and to tell us what your institutional needs are, how things work at your university, what students you work with, so that we can ensure that it works for you. 
we can come to your institution and potentially um, interview students and staff to go into our course videos. We might want to show you might want to showcase work that you're doing, or simply um, involve your students so that their voices are heard. It's this input from the development group members that really makes our programs what they are. It's what makes them high quality and well rounded, and is what how we ensure that they actually work for real universities. If you are thinking of using an epigenome product, you have two real options. The, the first and main option is the collaboration model, which is what we're talking about today, which is where a university invests the fee to join this collaboration group and as a result get significant input into the course development. You'll be able to further customise the course once you have it on your VLE or whether you're using our hosted platform and you would receive full programme licence in perpetuity for that programme. It's a really fantastic um, setup. And like I said, the, the real bonus is the chance to influence and shape the content of the course. There is a second option, which is to purchase a license. This is only possible once the course is published, so we're talking about um, almost two years from now. You can still customise the course, but there's no opportunity to content shape or influence the scope. And the licences are available for one, three or five years. We take what we call an expertise-driven approach here. So as well as our development group of universities who are telling us what's happening in the market and helping us ensure the product meets the needs, we have our lead advisor, we have Tracy, we have an advisory panel, we have authors, we have reviewers, and then we have the Epigean team as well. And the entire Epigean team is in-house. So we have our editorial team, we have our tech developers, we have our designers here, we're all working together. We also have implementation experts so that when universities are using our courses, you get tailored help with taking workshop approach, using a blended approach. We can come to your institution and help roll out the program with you so that you're not buying a course and just popping it on your VLE and letting it gather dust. We really help you to roll out the, wide, the wider program. So just to recap the process, I won't go into the details, but this shows you the timeline um, for the development group from the point of the workshop. So the workshop will be held towards the very end of this year, and if you're in the collaborative group, you send delegates to this workshop where you meet authors, reviewers and staff, and that's really where you get to see in a lot of detail what is planned for each screen of the course and give us your feedback. The authors then review it based on what you said, and then we'll go away and start writing the programme. All development group members get to review the draft course using an online commenting tool. All your comments are shared amongst the group, so you can share quibbles, disagreements, you can see where your, your needs are the same, where they might differ, and all of that feedback is shared with authors. Our courses tend to go through between four and five versions, from first draft to publication, which is, I, don't, I think that's unparalleled. I don't know of anywhere else going through that kind of um, level of revision, and that's really what makes our courses quite special. As I mentioned, we can film at your university, showcase your work, and work that into the course. And then once the course is published, which I believe we're talking about the end of 2018, yes, get my years correct, you would receive access to the course in perpetuity as well as technical support. There would also be ongoing updates to the content which you would receive free of charge. Great, thank you very much Rachel. So now I'm going to show you a quick demonstration of one of our published courses. So I'm going to go onto the website now. Firstly I'm going to take you through a few of the key features from a typical screen before showing you some of the main features across our course. So the students and staff will gain access to the course through the portal and once we click through onto the course it will take us to the main screen that you can see here. So this is the welcome screen and so we can see a list of the authors who have helped develop the course. Then we've got the learning outcomes, a detailed course structure so you know what to expect along the way a list of supporting institutions who were involved in the development of the course. So if you were to decide to take part in the development group, your name would appear here. And course highlights to look out for. Now moving on to the main course screen, I'll highlight a few of the features relevant to all courses. At the top of every screen, we'll see what we would call a learning outcome, or in this case, a screen challenge. It relates to the topic covered on the screen, usually a question for reflection. 
A learning outcome will show what students should have learnt or should be able to do after completing the screen. We also offer an estimated duration for each screen so that students have an idea of how long it is likely to take to work through the screen. The timing does not include the sidebar activities, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, we use real students when writing the timings, but we are mindful of the fact that students work at a varying pace, especially international students where English isn't their first language. All courses have a text version of the, each screen. You can see it's slightly different. And this is fully accessible for those using screen readers or those who are unable to use the interactive version for any reason. Down the side of the panel, you can see what we refer to on the side, the side panel as pods. These are, offer additional activities with extra information on the topic at hand and enable us to keep the main screens a nice and manageable size. One pod that's really interesting is the Your Context pod. These handy pods enable your institution to include your own text and links to your own resources and websites. A great way to customise the course and point your students or staff in the right direction for guidelines and places for extra support. Now we'll look at another screen where you can see different types of activities. So here we have a video. Videos are a key part of our Epigeum courses and it really helps to bring the material to life. They feature real students and staff from the development group from all ranges of backgrounds, including international and mature students. As Rachel said before, a development group member, we can go to your institution and interview your staff and students, and you will showcase your real life case studies and what you, you are doing in your particular institution. The videos also include a transcript for those where English isn't their first language or if they want a leave behind or something to follow. I'm going to test to see if I can show you a video now. In my second and third years I took internships in marketing and this is where it's led to a career in marketing and that is absolutely crucial. You, if you haven't done an internship or completed any work experience, you're holding yourself back. So one thing I'll say is get out there and get some decent work experience behind you. Yeah, a bit of volunteering, a bit of work, a bit of academic going a bit further academically as well than it would be as normally is required. Learning and doing rather than just passively doing exams that are given to you. I was involved in a scheme called the Edge Award and that allowed me to kind of look at my employability skills and I kind of was concerned with developing me as an employable graduate. Okay, so that's just a sample of one of our videos. Now I'll just take you to the last screen where we can see a presentational activity and an interactive activity. So the first one is a presentation activity and it shows the core learning content and allows the student to gain key skills and knowledge. Further down on the screen we can see the interactive activity. These type of activities allow the student to reflect on what they've learnt. Here you can see they will always get feedback from what they've, take, what they've done on the activity. So, I hope I've given you a good taste of what an Epigeum course looks like. Um, now we're going to move on to the Q&A section. So, if you do have any questions, please type them into the side panel screen now. Um, I think we've got a few questions. So, Tracy, here's one. Will the course cover library information literacy skills development? Well, absolutely, of course. I think it goes without saying, I've talked a lot about the fact that we know we need to support students on academic literacies, and for me that crucially and firstly includes library skills. If you don't know how to use the library, the databases, how to find sources, if you don't know what an actual academic peer-reviewed source is and how to differentiate that from a Google search or from something like Course Hero, um, then you're really in trouble. So, of course, that's going to be covered, particularly in the first course, in the first year course for students, but it will also be reinforced all throughout every single course for the students. Great, thank you very much. And 
I think there's one more question. So I'll ask this and then we'll move on to the contact details at the end. So what makes this new online course different to other courses, including the Avoiding Plagiarism course that Epigeum already has? Well, I don't want to put EpiGM's existing course down. I think it's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Um, I think there's a couple of points that differentiates this from what you've already got. I think we've moved on from just being concerned about text and how to manipulate and use text, which is what plagiarism is about. It's about text and cutting and, and pasting from sources. It's not that that's not a problem still, it, it really is. So it's not like we're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We'll certainly be covering plagiarism, but plagiarism is just one breach of academic integrity. There's so many other types of breaches, from cheating in exams, collusion, and obviously contract cheating, uh, falsification of data, uh, falsifying references, which is not plagiarism, but it's certainly a breach. Um, stealing another student's work or, you know, collaborating too closely. There's so many different types of breaches. So I think focusing only on plagiarism um, doesn't represent the full scope of the, of the issues we need to look at. And that, that's the first thing. But the second point that I think is the most important is that when, you know, we talk about avoiding plagiarism, it's always the responsibility of the student. The student has to learn to do this so that they don't get into trouble. And I think what our program is going to do is going to be much more ambitious. As I've said, we're going to be focusing on not just students, but teaching staff and professional administrative staff. And we're going to target those three stakeholder groups at different times and in different places in a just-in-time sort of approach so that students get what they need when they need it. Um, we're not going to be taking some generic approach that just, you know, one size fits all. We're also going to be looking at different disciplinary needs, as, as uh, Rachel mentioned. So I think it's not that the avoiding plagiarism um, module is not useful, and we'll certainly be incorporating a lot of that, but that will just be one part of what we're doing, and that represents only one stakeholder group. I think what we're doing is much more ambitious, and I hope, you know, I really do hope it makes a significant change in the way higher education is perceived, and, and the value that students get out of their degree as a result. Thanks, Tracy. Okay, so we've more or less come to the end of the webinar. Um, I just want to share with you some contact details. Some of you may already be in contact with some of our colleagues in regards to this course. We can give you a lot more detail in regards to pricing and specific requirements for your institution. So please do contact us if you have any questions. Um, and email epigeum at oup.com and your local sales rep will be in touch or you can register your interest on our website at the address shown here www.epigeum.com forward slash collaboration forward slash get involved. Also we will be sending out a recording of this presentation so you can share it with relevant colleagues who may find this of interest or if you want to watch it again to to reflect on what has been talked about. So thank you very much for attending this webinar today and thanks very much to our speakers. It's been really, really fun and really useful. So have a lovely rest of your day and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you and goodbye.